uh, this is Zain Odad. Uh, I'm here representing a small team of uh, data scientists and uh, software developers, software engineers. I'm a software engineer myself, um, even though I, I do a lot of architecting uh, for cloud deployments. Uh, this is actually one of our more open source experimentation, a bit in the R&D. <coughs> Basically, we're trying to see what kind of uh, graph-based inferences we can have um, within the um, Kubernetes environment, um, dealing with several different cybersecurity uh, scenarios. So this is, I mean, kind of an um, interesting landscape. As you see on the left, it is uh, all cheerful looking with the infographics. Uh, in fact, it feels those are kind of worrisome facts um, in this um, displayed in kind of a caricaturized fashion. That is basically uh, kind of telling to go that there are two hand-to-hand uh, -hand development, uh, one on the cybersecurity and obviously a lot of uh, you know, digital assets being uh, available in the cloud, um, a lot of types of new attacks coming up, especially after COVID, um, we have uh, ransomware and variety of uh, sort of techniques being developed. Um, on the other hand, we have obviously a very uh, sort of promising rate in uh, cloud data technology adoption. <coughs> that, that landscape actually, uh, you can see there's a, there's a big growth in the security and uh, sort of compliance area and associated with the, also the observability um, because they kind of go hand in hand. As new things become available, people are eager to kind of adopt uh, in terms of their uh, modernization, digital transformation processes. But maturing takes a little bit of time. And in the process, that's a great opportunity for um, you know, hackers or attackers to make um, some, come up with some creative ways, just like you know, people come up with creative ways of improving the performance, um, having you know, um, increased capabilities and uh, ease up certain processes. They, they have a creative way of uh, kind of finding new vulnerabilities, new exposures, new weaknesses, and exploit them. Um, this is obviously some kind of a, it's not a mystery, everybody's seeing this. Therefore, you would have some global uh, in industry and government and agency and institution level cooperation in terms of um, several agencies and institutions. First of all, um, um, publishing standards specific to cloud native technologies, securing the cloud native technologies. There was an executive order, I think uh, 2021, like uh, October, that basically started a whole slew of uh, hardening, Kubernetes hardening guidelines. And there were a lot of benchmarking and best practices that were published. CNCF just recently also, I think uh, beginning of the June, they, they are publishing uh, machine readable, uh, fully compliant, well, at least translatable to uh, NIST um, sort of 800 to 18 standard, I guess, for compliance assessment. Um, so there's a lot of work in that area. And then on the other hand, you also have security experts and sort of uh, folks individually or smaller platforms uh, providing OS intelligence, open source intelligence, in the sense that people report, there's hacker news attacks are reported there, vulnerabilities when they're discovered, they're sort of, uh, I think hacker one collects the uh, vulnerabilities. And there's all these individuals um, SMEs, they, they basically make these available as RSS, so this is actually a nice place to uh, monitor the activities. Um, oh, and why, why GNN, why graph-based? Uh, this is a complex, obviously, landscape, right? There are many moving parts. Even though cloud-native uh, sort of deployments are kind of exciting, there's a lot of complexity in maintaining the life cycle. Observability is a huge issue, many moving parts, so it is kind of crucial uh, to be able to represent the problem in a most realistic and dynamic way and not sort of be uh, stuck in hardened frameworks. And what I was thinking, the inference is actually um, a lot more natural than you think about in terms of uh, graph models. And graph models are not new. Uh, back in my time, uh, there's knowledge graphs and graph-based inference. It was big then, it was forgotten. Now it's together with the deep learning making a comeback. And they, they have very uh, impressive success stories in terms of drug discovery and other kinds of complex pattern uh, discoveries. So within this, there's also, um, in the landscape, people are trying to coordinate, right? They, they try to wire these uh, sort of um, SME-driven, uh, vetted, curated uh, networks released on maybe once, twice a year, 
uh, into sort of more dynamic uh, databases like the CV common vulnerability and exposures and the national uh, vulnerability database. They're all trying to sort of make some kind of mapping. But you can see from the release uh, frequency, I mean, you might have, I don't know, maybe uh, at least five uh, updates to your attack framework or any kind of framework that, any kind of graph model that you're trying to capture sort of the types of techniques that are evolving. But at the same time, when you look at the vulnerabilities, it's like a one published pretty much every day now. And this is the reason it slows down in 2020 because I think uh, uh, COVID affected everyone and the approval process slowed down. I'm, I'm, making, I'm pretty sure it's gonna make a big comeback and you're gonna have more and more uh, sort of vulnerabilities hitting. So you cannot have this manually uh, vetted and you cannot have these man mappings done manually. There has to be some AI initiative to dynamically associate these uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses with the sort of existing frameworks. And MITRE ATT&CK is one of the most promising ones and everybody's talking about it. They've been trying to capture different aspects of it. So for graph inference, then I started uh, to think, okay, um, then we can have uh, basically several scenarios. There are knowledge graph driven scenarios. So we can have threat exploration, right? Given the MITRE's capacity of identifying uh, intruder profiles and agents that you know, do the attacks, uh, malware, uh, software. Um, and then the other side of it, you can have, uh, if we can ingest the OSINT intelligence um, feeds uh, in a reasonable way, uh, if, if you can actually uh, read the bad stuff, useless stuff, or misinformation from that, and capture uh, together with your uh, sort of data feeds from the databases, uh, you can actually have an impact analysis on variation of vulnerabilities and how, might, how they may actually enable certain variations on the techniques that you know. Uh, so that's impact analysis. Um, and another, obviously, um, recommendation, recommender action type uh, use of the knowledge graph is uh, already explored by MITRE. They, in addition to have an attack model, they're build, building uh, a defense model. So it used to be that you just have, based on the detect, detected technique, you would have a course of action to mitigate. Now they have a full-blown uh, sort of set of techniques that you can use in combination to address the attack that you recognize. So all these things are not new, um, and there, there's a lot of uh, sort of activity uh, in, in many respects, but we wanted to start with um, threat detection, and we wanted to start with um, Kubernetes, and because we, we thought, let's take Kubernetes as a uh, organism, and let's get a lot of information from it as, as frequently as we can, and only, uh, not only look at things that we can measure, but try to capture as much as information as possible. This cannot be done with the thresholds. Your Kubernetes environment will have different um, diagnosis state uh, if you're in a production environment, development, or test environment. Uh, even, you know, the behavior will change from day to day, weekly, uh, or for certain seasons. So, everybody will have their own baseline. So we wanna be able to capture that, first of all, and then establish a baseline, and then being able to express this in open metrics. We can issue queries, and we can look at the rates of changes that are critical in our environment, in, in that they're pointing at some kind of technique in action. So we took the uh, Kubernetes, uh, uh, the side is completely us trying to uh, merge it into the knowledge graph and we have MITRE attack on one side, but the, as you will see, the MITRE technique is kind of generic. It doesn't, it doesn't really cover anything Kubernetes specific, very high level. Then we looked at the uh, Microsoft security threat matrix, which is far more Kubernetes specific to the extent that we can actually identify um, what to measure, what Kubernetes resource to go after, and what to watch for. And we wanna also make sure that we don't have a fixed model because we can inc introduce different kinds of measures, different kinds of resources, and we wanna make it as dynamic as possible, possibly employ some kind of um, um, online uh, training with little batches and do online training as it comes and making sure that it doesn't forget what happened. So it, it will be training on small batches with the data flowing in, streaming in, and it will be making inferences as it learns um, from various patterns of activities. And uh, for this, we use the DGL uh, graph library excellent uh, sort of uh, uh, library with a lot of examples. Some of some are more sort of mature than the others. For instance, the 
the heterogeneous uh, graph that we're dealing with, the link prediction wasn't, wasn't very strong, to be honest. I mean, it just illustrates um, one particular scenario. So the sort of our experimentation is on, uh, available on that uh, particular website. Uh, feel free to go look, it's in, under heavy construction. But what we're looking at as a full vision um, is um, having, first of all, some scenarios identify our Kubernetes agents and the types of inferences that we want to tackle. And we want to basically not only uh, publish uh, the models that we develop uh, for this specific, uh, also full pipelines of uh, how we, we are going to train end-to-end -end implementation as an example, and probably um, try to contribute it uh, into open source libraries like that, because without anybody else's con uh, contribution, I don't think we would have made any sort of uh, progress. It is thanks to a lot of people implementing these uh, approaches and algorithms that can get really complex, that, that sort of helped us putting together our own examples. The other very helpful point would be not only the uh, graph models um, sort of shared, but the data sets specific to the libraries, PyTorch or um, DGL for that matter, TensorFlow, whichever way we want to use it. Um, what we want to do is we want to basically capture some business as usual, like healthy diagnostic states with some measurements uh, in open, open sort of metrics uh, format. And also we want to capture some data in, in terms of um, simulated attacks uh, and how you're, you know, maybe if, not lucky, but if you get to sort of get an attack, we may actually capture that information and we may encounter measures that we never thought would be related uh, from, from that information. So that will be a much kind of richer way to contribute um, in data for people to, you know, take over, benchmark their models, um, play with different variations in their sort of um, approaches um, to convolution, however they want to sort of pro proceed with it, and also for validation and um, uh, testing. It, it will be extremely helpful. Um, so that, that is kind of what we had in mind uh, in this experimentation, and that pretty much completes, I hope I'm not, uh, I didn't even see the sign, but I hope I'm in time. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so I mean, and I hope, too many images, I hope nobody gets a stomach upset right before the dinner, but I just want to finish with more images from OpenAI, um, just playing with it and getting some random generated art. Uh, using the keywords for my presentation. Anyway, that, that's probably slightly more interesting than our experiments. <laughs> so hope hope this is uh, inspiring or just in, uh, interesting, and I'm happy to have any suggestions and um, so that we can sort of explore any anything that you would think would be relevant. We can explore that area. So I'm open to any feedback, questions. If not, I think it's dinner time. Uh, yeah, actually, the slides should be in the schedule, so you can pull up from the slide, um, and you can, uh, it, 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 it's there. I, I put the latest and greatest version, so it's an update. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving the opportunity.